Everybody feels really bad for <laughs> leaving Nicholas' session. Poor guy. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, Dan and I thought this was going to build as a, as a double act. But we thought that it might be slightly more interesting if we, um, if we opened it out to more of a group <coughs> discussion about burning topics in relation to CSS. So uh, there's a bunch of us that will participate in this for a little while. Um, and uh, then we can just open the floor up and have a general Q&A session. If there's anything burning on your mind, um, don't be afraid to put your hand up or, uh, or tweet something and we can pick that up on the Twitter feed. So, uh, my first guest. <laughs> I've known you for a long time, haven't I, Stephen? Been a long time. About four years. It's about four years. And, about uh, four years. I'm sure everybody who was in the session this morning knows exactly what you're about. I'll be interested in finding out a few more things. So, uh, my first guest, Mr. Stephen Hay. Stuff these days. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I've got my notes. How you been, mate? All right. Fine. You? You know, bearing up. How, how's the audience? <laughs> <laughs> Don't you feel sorry for Nicholas? No. He's here with his mom. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel bad. Maybe we should run over there and, and take a look. So that was a good session this morning. I enjoyed that. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions sprung to mind um, that I didn't get a chance to ask at, at the end of your session. Um, I really like the way that you've you've taken the essence of, or part of the essence of what Ethan was talking about in that whole responsive design article. Um, but rather than focus it around devices, which is something that I've been doing. I, I, I published a, a media queries boilerplate um, of device oh, sizes last week, and I got, I don't know whether Jeremy's here. I think Jeremy's probably JavaScripting in the next room. Um, but Jeremy said, oh, I think that's the wrong thing to do. Because you know, you're focusing on devices first, rather than what you were talking about, which is content first. Um, <coughs> and he said, you know, you might as well go back to the old kind of best viewed in Netscape for yeah. labels if you're designing for specific spaces. But what interested me about what you were talking about was where this whole approach can fit inside the design workflow when we're talking about content out. Now we're talking about this whole kind of content out approach for well, since that last book, where we write HTML to suit the content and then figure out how to do a, a layout or a design with CSS afterwards. Of course, that relies very much on getting the content in the first place. And so does your approach in terms of making something responsive. So, I don't know about anybody else, but does anybody else still struggle with getting content from clients before you start designing it? <laughs> I once waited two weeks for some content for like a services page for a small company. And when, he, when the guy finally could be asked to send it over to me, um, it was one single unordered list with about six bullet points. That's what he spent two weeks doing. The worst thing was, was that he'd mixed an ampersand and the word and, not only in the same list, but in the same list item, which showed me his attention to detail. So, it, it, everybody struggles with this, I think. How, how does that fit into your approach? What's your strategy for getting content out of clients before you can actually start this process? Uh, you need a, a table and some pliers. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, it depends on the client, actually. Yeah, um, if you if you think about it, we, when we make a website, we're making it for a certain reason. So someone somewhere knows what that reason is and knows basically what type of content is going to be in there. Um, you don't want to use things like a lorem ipsum usually. Um, unless you exactly know what that's going to represent. Lorem Ipsum uh, it can be a useful tool, at least it used to be, um, when they knew exactly how much space they, they had and what the, what the form would be of, of the content. Um, so 
now uh, we try to get as, as good of an idea of what the content will be as possible, and then we don't design um, complete pages that you can look at. Like I mentioned this morning, it, it's, it looks kind of like a page, but it's more of a, a it's more of a, a design impression, actually. And then you don't have to have these discussions about content. Because I, I, I used to make things in Photoshop and uh, show it to a client, and they didn't think up the content. So I had to think about, uh, okay, what, are, what, are, what am I gonna name these items on the, on the page? And then I'd show it to them, and then they'd say, oh, it's a nice design, but that sentence, you know, or that word, that's, that's not the right word. Uh, so that kind of discussion you get all the time. And uh, I try to avoid that. So just focus on the visual elements and kind of that separation that we always do. I separate the visual things from the, the, the layout of the page from the, from the content of the page. So that usually works okay, but it's a, it's a long process. And we pretty much just tell the client, well, if you want the site, when do you want it done? And if they say, well, I want it done by the 1st of December, then I'll say, okay, then we need the content next week. And if you don't get that, then we won't make the deadline. So you just have to be pretty, um, you have to stand your ground. And if you work in a larger company, that's hard, because at, at Cinnamon, I was the one who talked to the clients, so I could say that. And we had the type of reputation that, that you could probably get away with saying that. But if you work in front end somewhere, and uh, your boss has to explain that to a client, usually the boss is not on your side. It seems like he's not on your side, but he or she, but on the side of the client. So you, you kind of have to help clients as well. You could also say, um, listen, I'm thinking about this kind of design, but can, can you help me? What types of things will I have on the page uh, or whatever? So just kind of pry them and stroke their ego and get them to deliver earlier. How, how much of your work now is working on content? And, and how much are you leading the client down the road of, for example, um, working with them on content strategies, but also on, for example, producing content. Because, you know, I, I know I've worked for people in the past that could hardly string two or three words together in English. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't make for a great website. So hiring copywriters, yeah. for example. I mean, are you, how, how are you approaching that? And how are you structuring that maybe in terms of your um, proposals or estimates or billing? I always recommend uh, that the client uh, put aside a budget for a copywriter and if they um, if they don't, then they pretty much have to come up with their own copy. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to write copy for them. So we don't do a lot of content that way. We'll, we'll look at the content, we'll analyze the content um, for information architecture purposes. But um, sometimes if they ask, I'll hire, uh, I'll offer to hire a copywriter for them. But we won't, we won't do it ourselves. It's, it's specialized uh, business, you know. So. And. This, I think this is an interesting point that comes up a lot when we start talking about, we'll start talking about designing in a browser and getting into code a lot quicker than I think a lot of um, traditional companies have done in the past. Um, and you know, what, what I've been writing about in terms of designing in the browser, not showing client Photoshop comps, and you've been doing the same thing and getting much more abstract in terms of the, what you're showing clients for design purposes in terms of mood boards and scrapbooks and, and that yeah. kind of thing. Um, the question that I get asked an awful lot when we start talking about this is, what about designers that can't code? What about purely visual designers <coughs> or organizations, whether they're design agencies or ad agencies or uh, government departments or wherever, that will have <coughs> designers that just design in Photoshop and they'll deliver comps and then there's a team of front-end developers that will do the HTML. How, how can this approach work for them? If it's a large group, um, one of the things that we've noticed by, by bigger groups, uh, companies, is that the visual designers have no idea what the front-end developers are doing. How many people work in a big company like that here? And do you experience that as well? Are, are the visual designers really, do you work together yeah. a lot? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. yeah? Okay, so it's so it's getting better apparently. <laughs> maybe, it's, maybe it's not as big a problem as it, as it used to be. Yeah, maybe. But well, it's still yes. is you have to really. It's, it's hard to, uh, of 
first they have to realize that there's something missing if they don't work together with the uh, front end developers. But once they realize that, the, the, the collaboration is uh, no problem. Well, Elliot J. Stocks, I think, started a incendiary Twitter debate a, a few months ago, and there's various blog posts that kind of popped up after this. Um, and I think he kicked the ball to kick the ball rolling by saying, um, "You're not a web designer unless you can write code." Yeah, I I do tend to agree with that, and because when we were uh, when I did print design, and I've known a lot of people, like Jeffrey Zeldman came from print, <laughs> a lot of people came from print, and we had to know a lot about the print process. We didn't have to actually run the printing press ourselves, but we had to know what 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 the ink's going to do on a certain type of paper um, with a certain type of uh, press. And Dan, you've done a lot of print work, right? So you have to know a lot about the whole process, uh, technically, and you have to prepare these things for the printer. So I think it's kind of the same thing. And you maybe don't have to code everything. I really, if, if I see more JavaScript than in one tweet, then my head starts to, and then it explodes. But um, other than that, uh, I, I do have to understand what's going on and what the developers at, at Cinnamon were doing um, when they were doing even the complicated stuff. So I, I do think you need it. It's not that hard to learn HTML and CSS. So if you want to design for the web, you it's a different type of design. So you have to use your tools, different types of tools. I'm going to jump in here because... Uh, You're I, not invited yet. <laughs> no, we are still co-hosting this. Session. Okay. Fine. I'm just the <laughs> silent partner. Um, the, the, the one place that I, I disagree with the, 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 the line being drawn so harshly that you have to code if you're going to be a web designer. You don't have to code. As you said, I think it's, it's, it's most important you have to understand the code. But as a print designer and as someone who actually teaches a lot of print designers who are scared of making the transition into the web, that they don't have to be scared. What they're scared of is that they have to, they think that they have to become a geek. They have to become a programmer. They have to become uh, very knowledgeable uh, about technology as opposed to design, which is what they are knowledgeable on and what they should be knowledgeable on. And web designers should be very knowledgeable when it comes to design, when it comes to typography, when it comes to interaction design, when it comes to information architecture. But saying that they have to be able to to code is kind of I think a big leap it's like it would be like saying a print designer has to be able to make their own plates and has to be able to make their own uh, to run the press if you understand how it works that you ha you have to understand the concept of, of dot gain if you're going to be a print designer if you're going to be a packaging designer you have to understand packaging materials you don't have to know how to make them you don't have to know how to make the end result, but you do have to understand the entire process. And that is where I think the, the biggest missing link is, is that there are a lot of designers who work, especially in agencies, who don't, because they don't ever have to touch the code, they're given the requirements for the design, they design it, and then they pass it off to some unknown developer who might not even work in the agency that does the work and, and that's it. And they just have to see the final and give it their stamp of approval or, or complain to the developer. And so that's the gap that I think we need to we need to close. And the way we close it is by promoting communication between designers and developers. Like as when I was a print designer, and I won't keep going on about this too much longer, but when I was a print designer, I spoke with my printers all the time. When I was in the middle of a design process, I would bounce ideas off the printer and say, okay, well, I'm kind of thinking of these inks in this paper. <coughs> Is there anything I need to know about? Is this not going to work? And they would either tell me yes or no, or whether it was a problem with the press, not the inks and the printer. So if we change presses, you know, they were my technological resource when it came to, it came to printing. And I think if we have that same kind of, to kind of communication, we foster that between designers and developers, then designers don't have to know how to code. They just have to know how to speak to the smart developers and understand that those developers are an integral part of the process. I agree completely. I, I'll I'll disagree with you if it'll make it more exciting. Cool. Go ahead. <laughs> Can I ask you something? Um, both Stephen and I'm sorry, the man who shows. There's a mic somewhere. <laughs> this session is being recorded, so <laughs> uh, this will go out. Um, I understand you both uh, started in print, um, and I wonder what uh, pulled you over to 
start working with the web because I'm from a small company and we communicate a lot. I'm a web developer. I, we communicate a lot. We developers with the designers. But for, one, for some reason, <coughs> they do not want to code. They are so afraid and I wonder what can I tell them, how can I treat them so that they won't, won't be afraid to code. Actually, or at least to read the code. They don't have to be able to speak Chinese at least if they can at least read it, for example. Actually, if we're being, if we're being really accurate, we started off, we're, we're, we're artists, you and I, because I did a yeah. fine art degree. That, so did I. Yeah. Same, same here. <laughs> not, not, not a fine art degree. I was an artist when I was 12, 13, 14, 15. I discovered the web when I was 15, 16, so it went from art directly to design and, and the web. No. How old are you now, 20? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, okay, so let's see, when Mosaic came out, I would have been 16 or 17. I've been doing print design and type stuff since I was about 14 and a half, 15. I just, I just discovered it early and fell in love with all this stuff. So I was doing print design, and I actually had clients at like 16. And then the web, I started getting into it properly when I was probably about 18, 19. Um, but, but it all started in, in art. I think, I think to, to answer your question in part, um, I'm sure everybody here, but very, well, very few people here, I would imagine, um, went to college or went to university to learn the thing that they now do for a job. I certainly didn't. Um, and we learn what we know through late nights and drinking coffee and smoking too many cigarettes and having an, an interest in actually the subject. <laughs> I, I, I don't smoke. <laughs> okay, you just eat space cake. Um, <laughs> I know these things. Um, so it does come down to the personality of the individual. If somebody really doesn't want to get into learning how to code or how something works, then that's, that's absolutely fine. You, you can never force people to learn something. Um, I would, I would encourage you to sit designers and developers together to get a better understanding of how something works, even even at that simple level, so that you know the developer can say to the design person, "Hey, you see this heading in your comp? You've only put the heading on one line. You do realise that this is going to go to two lines, don't you? How much line height or leading do you want to put between the lines in this heading?" And the designer can go, that's too tight. And get an understanding of how the things actually work in the page. And hopefully that might spark some kind of interest. Yeah. Does that, does that, that answer your question? question? Well, that's, we're going we're gonna to move exactly on. That's exactly what we have been trying for years now. But I, maybe there's something in their ears, I don't know. So that's why I'm asking. That's about okay. making a style guide. You know, you just give them the elements and ask them to make a style guide every time before you have to start building it. And then in the style guide, you ask them to, uh, to, to give you the H1 to H6, <coughs> the uh, bullets and every, everything. Just have it there, document it. Yeah, it sounds like a good, good idea, thought. but it doesn't solve the problem of dynamic content and, and outlining things. And, well, you don't know how much text there's going to be. If, if there's a lot of text, it will... Well, then you just go yeah. to them. <laughs> yeah, that, well, that's what we've been doing for years now, but uh, they're very, very stubborn, so maybe just that's just our life. Well, we might come back to that in just, okay. in just a little while. I'm going I'm to move on to my next guest. <laughs> you can see I'm really enjoying this role. <laughs> <laughs> I always wanted to be on children's television, but... <laughs> something creepy about that. There is. <laughs> so, it's, it's, it's always designers and developers that we hear from when it comes to talking about CSS. Um, but there is an absolutely integral part of this whole, um, this whole field that I think tends to get ignored a little bit certainly in terms of how we may misunderstand how certain things work, and that's the browser space. So, we thought that it would be a good idea to kind of shift gears a little bit and have somebody who really knows what they're talking about when it comes to browsers. Hopefully, you said you did. Um, so, uh, <laughs> Anna Van Kesteren, who is... Uh, <laughs> I do, yes, for five years now. 
It's my favourite browser. <laughs> <laughs> you, Same here. You, if you follow me on Twitter, you'll know all about my love. <laughs> I, I tried to find your Twitter handler earlier, but Andy Clark is apparently a little girl somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I know that there is actually a photograph of me in Opera headquarters um, in Oslo, um, attached to the dartboard. Right, I was, yeah. Mm. Apparently so. So, also one in the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> I think I walked right into that, didn't I? Um, Right, a couple of things that are burning questions, I think, which you might be able to help answer for, for the group. Um, I know when I, when I start talking about a lot of um, emerging CSS stuff, I mean, we've heard a lot about it at the, the conference this week. Everything from you know, border radiuses to gradients to columns to whatever. All, the, all these exciting um, emerging CSS standards. Um, a great deal of which have to be prefixed with a dash mos or a dash webkit or a dash o um, vendor prefix. And I think there's a lot of confusion as to exactly what these things are, why they're there, and whether or not they are valid and we should use them or not. So can you enlighten everybody on vendor prefixes and if they're okay? Sure, I'll, I'll try to answer in order. Um... There was a lot of questions there, sorry. Yeah, no worries. Um, so the reason we have vendor prefixes is because, um, well, it's a nice way for the CSS working group to be able to change their mind, uh, which they often do. So then when we want to change the property syntax and it's not quite stable yet, we can still do so and not break everyone their site and whatever they were using. So ba basically what is done when we, we when a new draft is like Flexbox is created, uh, we draft Flexbox and have the various properties. Uh, but we're not quite sure yet about the design, but we want to have feedback on the design. So we want browser vendors to implement it so we can figure out how it works. And we actually want authors to use it too, so we can figure out if authors actually can understand the syntax and maybe have feedback on how it should work better. Like what was it again? Box, box align and box. Box pack. Box pack, right. Box pack is also some kind of aligning feature, which is kind of weird. But um, <coughs> and so therefore we have the prefixes so vendors can implement them uh, beforehand, then we can figure out, and then once it reaches a stable state, the draft goes to something the W3C calls candidate recommendation, which means everyone is very much encouraged to implement it, and at that point we can drop the prefixes, which is for instance, like uh, Opera now is, uh, we implement border radius, which is in a draft that is candidate recommendation, so we can do it without prefix. And the other vendors have yet to drop their prefixes, and they have to slightly change their syntax as well, because we change the syntax of border radius, for instance, uh, between multiple iterations. Um, and you had two more questions uh, at the end, which, uh, but I forgot. So, I mean, you, you mentioned there that you encourage authors, i.e. us. Well, right, yeah. So, yeah. So we, yeah. So they are, oh, right. And whether they were valid. So prefixes are not valid. The CSS draft does mention them, and it basically mentions them as a thing for user agents. So this is a convention user agents can use, and if user agents follow this convention, they will not clash with future versions of CSS, because CSS will not start introducing properties that start with a hyphen. Um, <coughs> And, but we do really want people to use them and deploy them and figure out if they work or not and break them. And I think it's fine if people use them in, in, in real life sites as well. I don't really care what people do. Um, as long as they, they, they update their syntax and be able to change those sites when the things change. Because if you use a, a prefix property, that is something that is in development and it will change over time. So you, so you sort of, you're at risk there, basically. And you have to realize that. So if then if, if they are if vendor prefixes are allowed, but they're not technically valid CSS, right. um, how does how sh how does that fit with what we've all grown up over the last few years um, in understanding <coughs> is that what we should be using are W3C standards, valid code, valid HTML, valid CSS. Are we not all of a sudden getting back to the Wild West days when anything goes? Well, I, I think you, you both want structure, but you also want the bit of Wild West, I think. Otherwise, it's not very interesting, right? <laughs> so you, you, you want to 
you want to start out with the basic subset, but you want to experiment a little bit. Like, why not add a transition to the, that hover thing you have over there? Because it, it makes it look a little nicer. It degrades very, very well, and why, yeah, I don't really see the problem with that. And people should experiment because otherwise they just stagnate in their their learning, and which is very bad. Um, but yeah, I, I yeah. So it's a, it's a mix. I mean, it's always. It's always in the gray area, right? For pretty much any subject. It's does the it, same here. Does yeah. anybody have a problem with using vendor prefixes? It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work in terms of <coughs> writing the same thing twice. I, I guess there, there's one more point to be made is that vendor prefixes serve two, and in some, for some vendors, they even serve three purposes. Like some are just implementations of um, features that are proposed and will become a standard eventually. Um, you can think of all the, the transition and transform stuff. Um, but they we might change the, they might change over time slightly. But there is also uh, vendor extensions uh, that are purely specific to the vendor and have not been submitted as a standard at all. Like uh, Microsoft has a Zoom uh, property, for instance, which I have no idea what it does, but it creates oh, it forces layout. It fixes stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Opera has actually we have some stuff as well. We at some point implemented the baseline O table baseline. We use as some kind of hack to implement MathML. But we don't really want people to play with it too much. Well, I mean that—that's that, a brilliant segue to my next question, which is. Um, we have a we have a question for. Oh, I've, okay. I have one question to it. Probably I don't get the point quite well, but I don't understand really the necessity of it. Eh? So, what is the difference between slash webkit box shadow and, and box shadow? So, if it if you are if the vendors are working on implementing it. Why is a stage in between whether you can use it? So uh, the thing is, uh, people wanted border radius. So vendors started adding uh, some kind of border radius feature. Um, and <coughs> they used different kind of syntaxes. We uh, hadn't really agreed on a syntax to use for the shorthand. Um, and the eventual shorthand that is now in the draft, which is something I made up, which I'm not sure it's very good, but uh, uh, people seem to like it is that you can set all the various uh, longhand properties, I guess would be the one for the ones that are longer. Uh, uh, you can set them all at once, just using the shorthand. And whereas the original WebKit implementation and, and, uh, and Gecko implementation didn't have that kind of capability, they only accepted uh, two values, I think. And maybe one of them accepted four. I forgot, I forgot the exact details of their implementations. But um, it's basically they, they put forward some kind of syntax proposal, but if they, they hijack the main namespace directly, like if they hijack the border radius property directly and people start using that, we can no longer say that border radius actually means something else. But if they prefix it and people just use the prefix version, then we can change the way the main one actually works. And once they update their implementations, all implementations will work the same for the main uh, property name. Okay, so I got it, but it sounds incredibly complicated. <laughs> And, okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah, standards is a mess, and it, it's very. Yeah. Wouldn't the wouldn't the uh, wouldn't the, al oh, I guess just... wouldn't the alternative be just that we all had to wait and not use any of these things until the standard had reached a point where all the browsers could, the browser implementers could feel confident confident enough to yeah. include it in there, and so we wouldn't have. That would mean that we still wouldn't have. We might have border radius now. Yeah. And, 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 but, and, 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 and there's another, as I mentioned earlier, we need, we need to have the implementer experience to make the specification right, because otherwise we don't know what to write in a specification. Often specifications are very vague. A good example was the original CSS2 specification. We have now spent over a decade of fixing that specification, because we just wrote, some, well, I, I didn't, I shouldn't say we, but some people wrote it up, <laughs> published it, and uh, expected people to be able to implement it. And, and, and that doesn't work. You need, you need to have the cycle where uh, the implementation feeds back to the specification, the specification feeds back to the implementation. And in there, we also actually, on top of that, we also need the input from alters. Alters need to give input to both. And that sort of all goes around in a circle or some kind of weird scheme. And, it, and then at, at some point, it's done. Is that, is that how the, uh, the syntax for CSS gradients ended up changing? Because um, the WebKit, uh, for anyone who's used CSS gradients, obviously the WebKit came out with it first and was pushing it, but it's this incredibly convoluted and complex syntax. And then you said the, the standard ended up being much more simple, and that's what Mozilla implemented. Yeah, I think, I think WebKit 
came up with something and then people that were sort of actively involved in the CSS working group, <coughs> I think in this case it was Tab Gatkins, who is now working for Google, mm -hmm. he didn't like it. So he wrote up a competing proposal and then implemented it in a, a small in PHP, I think, on the server, just to, to see how it would look like. And Mozilla liked that a lot better. And actually Dave Hyatt, who works for Apple and is, is pretty much their main layout guy, hidden in a dungeon somewhere and they don't want to lose him. <laughs> um, he liked it too. So they thought, okay, well, and everyone was sort of okay with changing the gradient syntax and, and nobody really cared for the WebKit one. So we're just going with the new one and then WebKit at some point will change. And and that's we'll the perfect anyone. example for this process, of, I think, of the uh, using these vendor prefixes because uh, you can continue to use the WebKit syntax if you want and du double up, right, the WebKit syntax and the uh, Mozilla, the Dash Moz syntax. And then once all the browsers have settled on using the standard just gradient syntax, WebKit most likely, we were discussing this earlier, will probably just continue to support support the Dash WebKit version, but also support the, the, the standards version once that's ready. So it won't, it won't break your older code. And I think that's one of the best benefits to authors for it. We get to play with stuff early, give feedback, and know that what we play with won't break later on when the browsers finally uh, implement the final standard. And I know that PPK has written in the past, although I think he might have taken it back in a, subsequent, back, yeah. in a subsequent blog post, but it was a commonly held complaint that somebody mentioned it earlier on. Yeah, you have to write the same thing three, four times. Um, you know, welcome to the real world. We don't have to write box model hacks anymore, kids. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's just part of, of, of how things are. And there are plenty of sites out there now who, which will help you actually just write the extra syntax if you need. I, I, there are plenty of them for gradients. Uh, Border-radius.com if you really have a problem writing multiple border radius okay. lines. Well, I've got one more question for you, which, is, uh, which has been burning on my mind. I know there was a... Um, a CSS working group Facebook -face <coughs> meeting two, three weeks ago? I think that was in Oslo, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, it was at Opera, actually. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that you were discussing at that point was um, the new priorities for the CSS working group going forward. Because I think the last ones were, um, were written in 2008, mm. and they were the priorities up till the end of 2010. So, yeah, right. Yeah. So basically what happens is like, um, there's a bunch of editors inside the, the CSS working group that edit documents. And every couple of years, we try to make sort of an assessment of where we at and what we want to do. Um, and then basically, we try to find out if a draft has uh, advocates in terms of, uh, well, people who want to edit, people who want to implement, and then sort of write up a new priority list for, for the next uh, charter thing, which is some kind of W3C concept of uh, high tool working group to see what they're going to work on. Well, the last time I looked, CSS marquees were a high priority. I'm sure that everybody's high priority, right? We all need those little scrolling things. Right, I'm, um, I'm gonna try to, you I have a list here. Yeah, I'm gonna take okay. a look. Uh, so, but the, the question that I have is that, um, well, there's two parts to this question. First, how does the, um, how does the working group's priority list and order relate to, let's say, the priorities for Opera software? So. Um, do you implement things based on what your customers are asking for or what's on the W3C list? We, we implement what our developers think is cool, um, <laughs> often. <laughs> but also what we, we ourselves, yeah, I don't know, we, we implement it on what web authors are asking for, basically. Right. Um, and sometimes what our developers think is cool. Yeah. So does that mean that... Or what Holcomb thinks is cool, really. Like he, has a, yeah, he has a bit of clout. Does that mean, in, in reality, then, that it's not the W3C or the CSS working group's priorities that matter. It's what the browser makers matter, think matters that happens first. Um, well, I, I guess you could say browser makers think, but really we, what, what we want to implement is we want to make cool products for, 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 for the web. Uh, so it matters what end users really want from the web and, what, and, and indirect also what, what authors want from the web, like what you want to create. Now, so if you guys want to create marquee things, then, then that would be a high priority. I think it was a high priority because of some mobile scam we got tied into. I'm not sure why. Well, you know, I didn't have a... I, didn't have a, a, to, to, a, I just looked through the list and I can't see marquee anywhere. It's not even low priority. Fantastic. Could I, could I, <laughs> I need to edit my new book to include the new project. Um, it's out in two weeks, kids. Um, <laughs> 
had a question there for a minute. Um, do, do you want to know the your do people want to know the priorities or yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know what the question was too when you finish this. So we, we actually put a things from high priority into maintenance, which is I guess things we consider ready, which is uh, CSS 2.1. I, I the, the plan is actually to get it to recommendation at the end of this year. I we'll, we'll see whether it happens, but it would be pretty cool. We're, we're trying to create uh, implementation reports at, at this moment for uh, all the implementations. There's a pretty big test suite with like 20,000 tests or something, so it's taking a while. Um, CSS color is going to maintenance. It's done, implemented everywhere, I think. I don't know about IE, really. I, I haven't followed IE for a long time now. It's very hard to get on a Mac uh, or on Linux. Yeah. Um, namespaces is going to maintenance, but I don't think anyone uses namespaces, so that's not very interesting. There is a small module of styling attributes, but that's not, I don't know, that's just a style attribute. That's not very interesting either. And, and selectors, which I guess everyone is using CSS selectors now, right? And they're like done. NTF child and whatever. Yeah, they're done. They're done. They're done. So high priority uh, backgrounds and borders. So that's yeah, multiple backgrounds, border radius. Uh, CSS for UI, which is uh, the uh, pseudo classes that are used with uh, HTML5 forms, like invalid, <coughs> required, those kind of things. Fonts, which probably everyone has used now or has seen at the conference. Um, there's CSS image values, which also uh, contains things like uh, gradients. Um, and we're implementing them in Opera, I confirmed earlier today. I, I'm not sure why we don't say these things out loud because it's not very much a secret. We give feedback on the public list, so it's pretty pretty obvious, but nobody's scanning that, I guess. Um, Multi-columns. Yes. It's high priority. <laughs> and I think everyone is implementing that now. We are too, uh, Hawken, as Hawken said. Um, 2D transforms, transitions, are high priority, values and units. Values and units has like uh, small things like you can you have a viewport unit, so you actually can set an element to be half the size of the current viewport, which might be kind of cool. So how and, can, and media queries as well. Yeah. So if Sorry, yeah. if the if what gets done in a browser is based on what we want hmm. and what the market wants, right? Um, so we all know Apple's agenda with you know keyframe animations and that kind of thing. Obviously, play to that market. What can we do? to influence your choice of priorities in terms of what goes first? I'm not sure, I was, I was just trying to think of something. Um, it might be kind of cool to have some kind of like stack overflow site, I guess, or something where you can just put up ideas for CSS and then people can vote and then we can see, wow, that, that feature is so popular. Like have some kind of a bug database for the web or something where, where authors have their feature requests and people can vote up, this feature is so important, we need browsers to implement this now. Then we can gouge interest and see whether it's actually feasible and have some kind of discussion forum on that. I think that'd be pretty neat if someone could set that up. Yeah. We, need to, we need to build this, mate. We need to build this kind of feedback thing. Just just use WebKit prefixes, though. <laughs> <laughs> we need to keep an eye on time. D Dave, Dave will come after you if you do that. <laughs> yeah, I also have a small question about this um, list of things you've um, just mentioned. What about hyphenation? Um, hyphenation so, is... Hyphenation is something that was, uh, well, making, uh, that was caused a lot of headache for me in the past. Like, uh, I really miss really good typography with good hyphenation like we used to in InDesign and, and so on. And I really, really miss uh, this attribute in, in, in browsers, actually, like uh, in current implementations as well. EE, EA never mentions it anyway, but... Um, actually, I don't see it in the list, should. but um, hyphenation is being discussed by the working group, I and mean, we do plan on doing something about it, since CSS is also going to be used a lot for, for e-books and such. Um, but the idea on how to do it and when it's ready, I, I don't really know, really. I haven't, I, I don't follow the paged media stuff a whole lot, then, uh, yeah, or, or the text level editing. I'm sorry. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Sure, yeah. and then we'll move on to Dan. Uh, Just scream. Okay, yeah, why, why is the, the advanced templating stuff, that's, that's because everyone's doing layouts and everyone's doing hex using floats and inline blocks, why isn't there a real movement in, in getting something like the, the templating stuff, if the display A, B, C stuff? Yeah. Um, I guess it's basically because we don't really know yet what we want to do. Um, there's a lot of interest from vendors in Flexbox. Um, as sort of like a putting, a, setting a first step in, in, in that direction, and 
I guess then we sort of want to figure out like how much can you do with Flexbox and how much more do we need to add. Like we don't want to add all the things at once because then it will just be a gigantic mess that we have to sort out in the next decade. Yeah. Uh, so we want to sort of evolve the whole thing incrementally with small steps and, and Flexbox is kind of a smaller step than, than the whole advanced layout thing. Yeah, sure. But it might may, may turn out that we need both. And but that, that will I think it will take longer, if, if realistically speaking, because Flexbox is being implemented by everyone right now. And um, advanced layout, I've seen one implementer question, but not, not a whole lot of interest so far. Yeah. Excellent. Well, we're going to move on. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Yeah. We've heard from him before. There is only one. I've got two mics, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Dan. How are you doing, Andy? Not bad. Should, should we do is it, is it karaoke tonight? <laughs> this is the burning We might have to go tonight. We might. We, might. we might have to go murder country tunes. <laughs> will, will you be Dolly for my Kenny? Again. If you bring the wig. Yes. Uh, before we actually jump in, uh, who asked about hyphenation? just because that's some one of my things too. Um, if you haven't read it yet, and anyone else who's interested in alternate options at least, since CSS doesn't give it to us yet, um, almost exactly a month ago on a list apart, uh, Richard Fink wrote an article about uh, like hyphenation and justific uh, just justification, yes, um, including uh, all sorts of like, good ways to add it to your designs, including a, a JavaScript that you can just kind of add in and it'll take care of a lot of it. And it, it's a good starting point because it's something you can use now and it, uh, it doesn't break any, any browsers that doesn't work in and gives you at least some control. Excellent. And now over to Andy. I have a question for you though. Really? Yes, I'm just here to service you. Do no, I'm not again. single. <laughs> oh, that wasn't the question. That wasn't the question. So you've been Responsive design, this whole media query circus that's been, everybody's been whipping up enthusiasm about over the last sort of, I think it, it goes back, the first time I saw Ethan talk about it was at an event apart in Seattle, which was at the beginning of this year. And by the end of Ethan's talk, Jeremy had sat there and implemented media queries on HuffDuffer, literally, you know, before Ethan had come off stage. And then since then, well, he's gone media query mad. Um, as have a lot of people. Um, but my, my question is more about um, using media queries and this whole kind of responsive approach while you're designing. Because you've been doing a lot of stuff with Jared Spall recently in terms of like the, the user testing stuff. Um, and almost I saw you talk about almost doing live redesigns or live designs with testers. How do you feel this whole kind of thing comes together? How can we um, how can we use this responsive approach in relation to designing something and testing it on the fly, which is what you would do? Well, that is a very good question. Um, well, the the specific stuff that I'd done with with Jared actually was <laughs> it couldn't really even be called live anything because uh, we were just using uh, basically the the. Uh, the image map form of, of uh, uh, testing high-level designs, you know, a background image of the entire comp, and then invisible uh, anchors above just to be able to test interaction of a final design, which, by the way, is a great way to test and iterate and test and iterate really quickly without having to build anything. But I think once we get into, and right now, user testing, uh, or usability testing, rather, we're not testing the users, we're testing what we've designed and built, um, is, is something that we tend to, you know, we'll, we'll sit people down in front of one device and monitor and screen that is of our choosing, as opposed to, um, and, and we do that, I think, to a certain extent, to control the environment, because it's, we, we perceive it as easier to test if we control the environment. Well, but we don't get to control the environment on the web, so um, I'd actually like to see media queries as a way that we can start to more easily adapt the environment that we use for usability testing, for instance, um, and test our, our designs that we're actually building responsively. We can test them responsively as well, which is kind of responsible, responsive testing. Um, there's too many words. I like code better when it comes to speaking because, you know, it's harder to get confused. And I'm a designer. Uh, but yeah, no, I, 
I'm a, anyone who, who was in, in my uh, workshop earlier this week. I see a couple of familiar faces. So you know that we, we actually spent quite a bit of time uh, talking about media queries, and I get really excited about it. Because I think it's the, the best and most important thing to happen to front-end design and development in the web. The minute that I saw and read Ethan's article, and the minute that I know a lot of other designers read Ethan's article, we immediately thought, yes, this is what the web should have always been. Why was it ever any other way? And uh, it's easy to get excited about because, as you said, like you, anyone can just, you can sit down and add media queries to your current site. I don't care. It, if, you, if you were in charge of CNN.com or BBC News, you could add media queries right now. You're not going to break anything. Only browsers that support the stuff is, are going to see it anyway. And you could start playing with it right now on a production site. You're not going to break anything. It's wonderful. And it allows us to... Now, now, I'm one of these people. I'm a designer who... How many designers in the room? People who would call themselves a designer before they would call themselves a developer. Okay, only a few of you. About the same person. Oh, no, more, more hands went up then. <laughs> Designers tend to clock out a little bit. We're all ditzy, so if it takes you a few seconds to notice, that's okay. I'm blonde too. It's all right. Um, I'm one of those designers who, maybe because I came from print and I wasn't born in the web as a designer, although I've been on the web since it started, um, I still like controlling the widths of my designs. I love the flexible, like fluid grid approach. I like that, but it, but I haven't been able to successfully implement it on with every client all the time. I think it really depends, and as designers, we get used to saying it depends a lot. Um, but the fact is that I mean, even what I like about media queries the most is that there are a lot of designers who refuse to even acknowledge the fact that uh, devices are different sizes and widths and pixel dimensions. And media queries makes it it's kind of an easy gateway drug to to using more more fluid and flexible elements in your design, even if the whole design itself isn't fluid and flexible. Um, you know, you look at designers like Dan Cedarholm, who are all about bulletproof everything and things being being able to resize and accept text size changes and everything else. And uh, if you take a look at how designers like Dan have implemented media queries just, just now, starting to play with them, you see the combination of fluid grids uh, still having a max width set on an element so that you know you do you still do have some control You don't want your line lengths your measure getting too wide because then people can't actually read your text That's always been my problem as a type centric designer with completely liquid and fluid layouts is because okay I don't want my paragraphs to be to turn to one line on a 30 inch monitor uh, So you do need to have some constraints to your design because as a, as a designer it's your responsibility to make sure it's always uh, readable legible but with media queries, we get to see even the most hardcore, I want everything to be set in pixels and never change designers can easily open up to saying, okay, well, I want it to be like this for the most part. But then I understand that, you know, someone might be on a larger device or screen. And especially someone might be on many different dimensions of a smaller monitor, because we all still understand that. Every designer who designs for the web understands that there are different sizes. We might ignore it, but we understand it. So media queries makes it easy to just say, okay, well, I'm, now I'm going to acknowledge it and then adapt my design. And that's a very, very important step, I think, because it takes, it allows designers who might not build things that are very flexible because of their ties to a rigid design, it allows them to make their designs more flexible. So even if it isn't what we might ideally want, I mean, even though I, I like fixed pixel things, I, I wish that I didn't. <laughs> I just can't necessarily unlock myself from that. But I don't mind using, you know, 15 media queries in my design to adapt to slight different changes in sizes and dimensions because I'm not thinking of one particular output device. I'm actually looking at the design and saying, proportionally, uh, when does this break? And then I add a media query to adjust, and then adjust again, and adjust again. I showed a great example in my workshop of, like, I was trying to push the envelope. I, I seriously had about 15 media queries in it, which all, because the entire design was built on M's, it was all just proportional. So all I actually had to adapt was the body type size. And so the entire design adapted to whatever the limits were, whether it's on, on the tiniest mobile device or the largest screen. And so I'm not thinking about design 
designing for a particular monitor or output size, I'm thinking about just how many how many different rules do I need to put into place to make sure that no matter what device this is viewed on, it's optimal. And so that's an, that's the other end of the spectrum, but I think it's just as valid. Well, we have five minutes of our allotted stolen time. Shall I ask you a question? Well, you could ask me a question, but or we, do we need to change seats. No, no, no. Or we could use the time to find out if anybody else has any questions for the rest of our esteemed guests Certainly. this afternoon. Five minutes. Um, we've fire got, away. We've got five, Go. five minutes rapid fire Q and A. And we have a mic, so uh, we let's. Oh, mic. we got a. Uh, and you'll be second, sir. I have one uh, question for Andy. Um, we're working in a big team with interaction designers. Uh, just uh, regular designers, uh, JavaScripters, CSSers, and they're all working on the, C the same HTML files. And recently, I read a comment about um, indenting and dogs barking up. <laughs> so, do you always work alone, or do you change your position in this when you're working on a bigger team? Um, I try to avoid working on bigger teams. <laughs> I try to. I, I try to do. Um, Are you saying you try to avoid working on a team or? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just unsociable. Are you capable of working on a team? Um, I have to. I have to draw a fine balance between what I prefer and what I know goes further on because I, I, I gave up building websites in terms of you know, delivering a finished product a little while ago because it was it got very boring. Um, so I concentrate on front-end design and code. So I'll deliver HTML and CSS templates. And I make those because I know that I'm not going to put them into production. Uh, I will make sure that they're as commented as possible and laid out so that somebody else can work on them. Um, my, I think this was on my Twitter thing. Um, th this was in relation to this new book that I have coming out. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> Which is about indenting code, um, and I just think that you know I, I prefer my code not indented because I think it looks tidier, and it has a nice clean left-hand edge. Um, yeah, obviously that's not as readable, and it's it's not really production-ready code. But in a book, I was trying to find out a, a, a balance between you know readable code and something that didn't look like it was crazy and take up 18 pages of code. Um, so yeah, we have to we have to write stuff which is which is readable by everyone. I have a suggestion, though, too. Uh, we had this conversation at, during lunch at my workshop, too, with uh, a couple of people. Um, if you have teams all working on you know, uh, the same markup and the same styles, especially when it comes to the styles, I'm a huge fan of using scratch files. And I know you use them as well. This, yeah. Because I, I think it's really inefficient. If you hire someone because they're good at writing CSS, they're really good at what they do, one of the reasons they're really good and efficient at what they do is that whatever their personal style is, the minute that you start to make them conform to a different style of indenting, and whether you put a space after the colon or not, I hate putting a space after the colon, some people love it, right? Having to change that interrupts your flow. It means you're gonna be thinking about stuff that has nothing to do with writing, writing good CSS. Um, so if you can have give all your CSS uh, developers their own scratch file and have one person who's actually acts as the editor and, and at certain points, certain milestones, you just compile it all into the final once you've decided, yes, all this works, then that one person is in charge of getting all that code to match the style and that can solves I, the problem. Can I just Dan, Dan and Andy, I think we have to run to the other room. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We're finished? Yeah, we have to We've done it's fine. The other room is already done, so. Oh, okay. Oh. Well, yeah. um, thank you very much. That was quick. It was very quick. Didn't the time fly? <laughs>